repeat what we did earlier in our yeah. next version? Yeah, and, 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 and tell us a story about how that you went down to Saigon to get the money. Okay. Okay? Uh, I'm Hank Neal. I was the uh, brigade finance officer in Vietnam. Mm. When I arrived in Vietnam, I had a 30-man finance section, and I had no money. And a finance officer without money is like an infantry room without bullets. Yeah. So I immediately had to get money. So in order to do that, I had to go down to Saigon to a place called the Central Funding Office, which is uh, where the finance officers got their money. The brigade commander said nobody could leave the area of operation without his personal approval. So I went up to see him, told him what I had to do. I had to go down and get the money. He agreed that was worthwhile going. So we headed south with myself, a sergeant, Staff Sergeant Mortensen, and two soldiers, uh, POC Gary Berard, who you may know because he's active in our society, and uh, POC John Grunty. We uh, left Quang Tree and headed for Saigon. It took us about four days to get down here. We didn't have a clue where we were going. We didn't have a clue what we were doing other than we had to get to the central, alleged central funding office. Uh, so we got to the little airstrip there in Quang Tree and waited around, and we flew down to Nang and waited around, so on and so forth. So it was about four days to get down to where we were going. When we got to Saigon, uh, we had to go out to the central funding office, which we didn't know where it was. And apparently nobody else did either. <laughs> because Kept it a secret. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's where all the money came in yeah. to, to uh, support the war effort in Vietnam. So uh, I came out of Tonsonut Airport. We're hot, we're tired because we hadn't really slept and eaten much in really four nights. And um, they said, oh, you, you need to get out the Long Bend. Okay, how do I do that? So we take the bus. Okay, how do I do that? And the bus is outside here, the bus stop. Just tell them we're going Long Bend? Yeah. They, they have, the Navy ran the bus system, and they had color-coded plaques in the window, red, blue, green, whatever, according to where he wanted to go. So the guy told me, he said, well, you need the red bus. So I just get on the Navy bus, pulls up, it's got red, black, and corner. We get on the bus, and we ride for 20 minutes, half hour. I <laughs> tap the driver on, and I say, when are we going to get to uh, the Long Bend? Oh, you want to go to Long Bend? I said, yeah. well, you're on the wrong bus. See, it's supposed to be on the green bus or whatever. <laughs> okay, how do I get to the green bus? Well, he says, you, you get off two or three stops forward, and, and you take the red bus, and the red bus will take you to the green bus. And then you go up Long Bend. So this went on, and we finally, after going through most of the colors of the rainbow, <laughs> we finally got out to Long Bend. Get to Long Bend. Now, read my We came into Quang Tree. Quang Tree is right up by the Demotri Zone. It's mm -hmm. a muddy place. It's dirty. Uh, the wind blows. And you get your ankles in mud, and the wind's blowing dust at you. I don't know how that works, but it works. And uh, <clears throat> we go out and get off to, down there in Saigon, look around, and you, people are dressed in civilian clothes. Most of the soldiers didn't have weapons. Uh, MPs did, and people guarding specific things, but it's just unbelievable. It's different from where we were. So uh, we finally got out there, and uh, the sergeant with me said, don't worry about me and the two GIs. I'll get them. We'll, we'll be taken care of. We'll make sure they eat, and we'll get a place to sleep. No problem. I knew the colonel that was in charge of all the finance officers. <clears throat> uh, I had worked for him at the Army Finance Center in Indianapolis on an earlier assignment. So I went to see him, found him. I go in, I couldn't believe the building. It was uh, like a regular office in the United States. Fluorescent lights, wow. civilian secretaries, nicely dressed ladies, both um, American and Vietnamese. I go in and see him, and uh, oh, here, what are you here for? I said, I'm here to get my money, but I don't know where to go. Oh, he said, we'll take, don't go, I'll get you there. But he says, uh, you just coming in? I said, yeah. He said, well, have you written your mother yet? No, I've been here in the country about three or four days, and I haven't written my money yet. Uh, he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what, you're going to stay with me tonight. And he said, here's a key. It's a trailer down here. And he told me how to get to this trailer. It was like a house trailer. It was a house trailer. And he said, go in, and you'll find a desk, and you can write your mom and uh, mama a letter. Okay, so I go down and unlock the door. I couldn't believe it. I walk in. There's a nice, nice um, uh, trailer, sofas, chairs, uh, full kitchen. Mm -hmm. Bedroom, I mean, shower, everything. So I go in and I find the desk. I start writing my mom a letter. <laughs> Being a good soldier, I did what the colonel told me to do. And I'm sitting there working away, and the door opens, and a guy comes in, and another colonel walks in. He says, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm Colonel Hirsch's friend, and 
I believe I'm staying with you tonight. Oh, well, he's going and right away. He asked me how I like my martinis. I said, excuse me? Said, I'm not really a martini man. But then he says, you know, well, you want steak or salmon for dinner? I said, well, that's unbelievable. Now, mind you, I hadn't eaten them. <laughs> right. so, Both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, have to the, I have to put a steak. <laughs> but anyway, it was so different there from that's what crazy. it was up in Pine Tree. Oh, that's crazy. But it turned out his buddy was another colonel, and uh, his roommate was another colonel. He was the IG for Vietnam. He was a nice man. Inspector General. Inspector yeah. General, yeah. A, a very nice man. Uh, so I hung around with him and cleaned up a little bit, and then my friend came down and they fixed steak for dinner. And wow. uh, I, I don't remember all the details, but. That night, all I remember is we were out in the back with a Montagnard bow and arrow shooting tin cans off the back of an old sofa. <laughs> <laughs> Something to do at night, you know? Wow. Now I'm saying, wait a minute, I've been in country like a week or less, and it's just been a whirlwind from Pung Tree to here. Anyway, I, I, so the next morning I said, we've got to get out to the, get the money to set the thing up, pay the troops. A bunch of us yeah. GIs had to get paid. He yeah. didn't have any money. Exactly. And there's about 5,000 guys <laughs> like him. <laughs> he don't know where to go. <laughs> didn't have a clue where to go. Well, listen to this story. So he says, well, i, I got to get back on the bus to get over to the central funding office. So he got me pointed in the right direction that way, picked up the other, the sergeant, the other two guys. We headed out. And I said, this is, this is screwed up. I can see this coming. So we got out there, and it's a, it's a rather nondescript concrete building. Not a, not a big building, but a concrete building. The barbed wire fence around it, and a guard, a Vietnamese guard in a white uniform, sitting there with a carbine on his lap, sound asleep. <laughs> I said, Well, so I, go up, I didn't want to tap the guy on the shoulder before he'd shoot me. So I, <clears throat> and I make some noise. He wakes up. And I didn't speak Vietnamese, he doesn't speak English. So I'm pointing out, guys, I'm in there, I gotta get in there. So <laughs> go ahead, he says, I'll go in. So at that point, I told my guys, I said, look, we're going to walk out of this building with a couple million dollars. I bet nobody asked for my ID card. So I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, no, you won't. I rang, they had like a doorbell, I rang the doorbell, we got inside, and inside, uh, uh, on that second page, I think there's a picture of inside, <coughs> we go in, there's millions of dollars, millions, hundreds of millions, probably all fresh money from the treasury. Now, it was a military payment certificate, wow. it's not U.S. greenbacks, although they had a bunch of them too. Yeah. And uh, stacks and boxes of them, and, and I said, well, I need, I forget, it was like a million, two million dollars. And the way that works with a finance officer, you're a treasury agent. So when you're a treasury agent, they give you a bunch of blank treasury checks. So I filled a check out, payable to Hank Neal, signed by Hank Neal, please. I give him the check and they give me the money. Now I'm accountable for that money. I have to either have valid pay vouchers yeah. that are signed or whatever to turn in at the end. So he, again, he said, how much you want? I forget how, let's, let's say it was two million. Substantial amount of money. And uh, uh, he said, okay, how do you want it? I can't, I can't take all 20s, which was the largest domin denomination they had of military payments. Trade. But if I just got 20s, it'd be worthless because nobody could make change. So I had so many nickels, dimes, on up. Yeah, so I get the money now. Earlier, I skipped over this part, earlier, um, coming down from Pine Tree, we had all of our gear, black jacket, helmet, and pistols, all that sort of stuff, gas mask, and uh, we had taken them off and put them in these big money bags. The Army gives finance officers big, heavy money bags. I put that stuff in it. Well, now we had to take that stuff out to put the money in it. So we take it out. And the money was a substantial uh, amount. There's a picture in that uh, bag they had. Um, I had to put that money in the bag, and then we had to get out of Dodge, head north. So the I got our money. <laughs> I, when I went in, they said they, they, knew, uh, they knew I was coming, but they did not ask for an ID card. They said, oh, Hank Neal, we, we heard you were coming. Now, the finance course is pretty small, but I didn't know any of those guys. And I got my money, put it in the bag, we put our helmets and stuff on again and headed out. Walked so, out with $2 million? No idea. So no. now I'm getting it back to the airport. That's so I said, well, how about you guys, how do I get back to this? Well, we, we have a truck. We usually take you out there, but our truck's broken. So what do I do? They said, well, you have to take the bus. <laughs> so I don't know. Back to the bus. So, 
true. So I said, well, how about an MP escort? So we screwed around for 15, 20, or half an hour probably trying to arrange an MP escort. That didn't work. None of it had worked. So I went back on the bus system. So now we're encumbered not only by all the gear we had, because we put that in our bag, but now we get these boxes and uh, we can see the money, how it came. Some wooden boxes and some other way bundled up. And, and we had to take that to the bus to get back to the airport. So I said, okay, there's four of us now. So I said, well, you and you take that box over there and go stay within I say go about 100 feet away. And you stay and guard the box, you come back here. And then you and you take this other box now and go up to them. I'll stay here and guard the money here. And then you come back and I'll get there and then we'll go to the same drill again until we got to the airport, until we got to the bus, which we eventually did. Now, nobody knew what we had, so our security lay in the fact that nobody knew what we had, and three M16s and a 45. <laughs> so, get on the bus, go through Saigon, and on back in, and uh, get to the airport, and then I felt a little more secure once we were there. Even though it was a civilian, it wasn't just a military airport, it was a civilian military airport. But once we got out on the plane, it's going all good to go. It took us another two or three days to get back up, because we'd hop and rise, just wait around for Jun to take you. Uh, so we got up there. <clears throat> Meanwhile, my, my soldiers and Darwin Pace, who's in our group here, uh, arranged, they took a Konex container, a big steel shipping container, yeah. and they backed it up to the back of my tent and put sandbags around it. So when I got back, we put the money in that Konex container, and we had field safes. The, the Army gives finance officers these heavy metal field safes. Put the money, break it down, put it in these field safes, combination safes. Close the Konex container. We had a Sergeant Greenleaf locked on the door that thing, and uh, we're in business. Now, when I went to see the colonel, because when I was going down to Saigon, he said he wanted to see me right away when I got back, so I could tell him what it was like down there. <coughs> so I got back, I went to see him. So, um, sir, you want to see me? Yep. What's it like down there? I said, you want a straight shot? I remember specifically, you want a straight shot? He said, yeah. I said, you wouldn't believe it. I said, people walking around, civilian clothes, no weapons. You see weapons, but people guard and stuff. Keeps moving through. But I go out the office. I say it's beautiful. I said, and he couldn't believe it because you know what? Quite true. Like. So, yeah, so that was play. the that was the total demilitarized zone between. Well, North but he well, says close to it. It was close to it. Gotcha. We were maybe eight miles below it. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, but it was dust and mud, and yeah. you know they, they were living in tents. We we hooked up with the Third Marine Division. Third Marine Division forward base was a place called Dong Ha. And these guys were above that. That's where the fighting troops were. Yeah. It was Don Ha. And then we were 30 miles maybe below Don Ha. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe eight miles. Eight, or so. yeah. 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 Big difference, though, because uh, North Vietnamese artillery could reach not only them, but Don Ha, but it couldn't reach Quang Tu. So it made a big difference. So that's where, where most of the support activity was. So now I'm in business and get got to get ready for payday. The reason I was on that assignment, I w my finance section was authorized a major, a deputy captain, a lieutenant, and a warrant officer. We did not have the major. I was a young captain, I was the finance officer. And I had Darwin was the lieutenant, and then I had another guy who was warrant officer. And um, uh, the reason I, I, say I got on that job is I had worked in the Army Finance Center prior to this on the new pay system called Centralized Automated Military Pay System. It was maybe the greatest thing happened to the army <laughs> since bullets, I guess. And uh, uh, the first cavalry division in Vietnam was under that system, but they went under it after they were in Vietnam. Nobody deployed under it, so they wanted to see how the system would work with so many deploying units over there. So I was picked because I knew the system, uh, and I knew Fort Carson had been assigned over there too to head up this new organization. Fortunately, having been at Fort Carson earlier, I knew the sergeant major in the personnel section. I said, they're going to impress us 5,000 guys for the brigade through the gymnasium. And I knew the Army was getting pretty slim at that time. I knew I wasn't going to get, I had a 30-man unit. I knew I wasn't going to get myself, the officers, and 27 school-trained soldiers. I might get six, eight of them, whatever. But I'm going to need more. So I got with the sergeant major and said, hey, when guys in process, I don't care what kind of job there's, infantry, chemical, cooks, whatever, if they have a degree in accounting or business, send them down to see me. I got to fill the roster. So he did that. 
we took them and sent them down. And almost all the guys that I got were college graduates. Wow. 